Hey, what's going on CISSP wannabes? I am Colin Weaver. You're watching the CISSP questions of the day from IT Dojo. And I come at you each time with two new questions to help you as you continue to prep for that CISSP exam. So let's look at question number one. Man, I have been on a smart card tear lately. Um, as part of your research for the implementation, <laughs> implementation of a smart card authentication mechanism, you are investigating the attack techniques that can be used against smart cards. My question for you is, which of the items that I'm gonna put up here is a valid technique for attackers to go after smart cards? Click pause, look over the answer choices. When you're ready, click play. I'll talk it through. Choice number one says the attacker is gonna do brute force attacks against the symmetric keys. No, there's a high degree of probability that there aren't even any symmetric keys on your smart card. Now that's not to say they're not supported because in some implementations they are but when they are there to the best of my knowledge about smart card deployments that are out there the symmetric keys are not used as a mechanism of identity proofing you um, they're used for other reasons and they're not even the pin doesn't even control access to them simply having physical possession of the card provides you access to the symmetric key and uh, an attacker going after that if they can go after that they already have the you know smart card so there's no gain to be had they need to go after the private keys that are on the smart card. That's where their value is, and so that's not the right answer. Choice two says they are going to factor the product of RSA primes. If you're using 2048-bit keys, uh, the likelihood that anytime soon they are going to factor the 2048-bit prime, not likely. So again, we're talking about numbers so big, it's the human brain doesn't even understand how big. So, no. Now, if you were, you, for some bizarro reason, using smart cards that only use 768-bit keys or 512-bit keys, then sure. And again, we can do the whole wink and a nod thing about, you know, you know government agencies that, that may be able to go in and do things that we don't know about. But by every measure known, there's no practical way to go in and, in a reasonable amount of time, uh, factor these key sizes that are commonly in use today, which means 2048 bits. Choice number three says that an attacker is going to go after your smart card by doing a side channel attack involving differential power analysis, or DPA. Uh, that sounds fancy, and it's also true. Um, differential power analysis or power analysis are techniques that can be used to go in and determine what data is, in our case the private key, by being able to go in and evaluate power usage by the system. And without getting too complex in this, basically by looking at how power is used, they can go in and tell that, okay, that was a one versus that was a zero. And it requires physical access to the card to do this. So um, the, the real circumstance where this is gonna work is like you lose your smart card, well, you're gonna report your smart card lost and then we're gonna go in and issue a new smart card. So there's a, there's a finite window when it can be done. Unfortunately, it can be done fairly quickly if somebody's well prepared for doing it, but um, what they really need is some alone time with your card and then maybe be able to recover those private keys and then um, be able to make you still have access to your card. So, you know, they sneak into your room at night and do this while you're sleeping or something like that. I'm, I'm kidding. But, um, but that is very much the right answer is this whole side channel, attack and, side channel attack and using differential power analysis. And the last choice, which I just put in to act as a distractor, is that there is malware that is on the uh, computer that you are logging into with this smart card that is able to extract the private key when the user logs in. And I am unaware of any mechanism that can do that. Um, so that is not the right answer either. Uh, the private key never leaves the card. So there's no way for the malware to, at least none that I know of, no way for the malware to get onto the card to somehow extract that private key. So not the right answer either. Um, the other way that somebody could go in and mess around with smart cards would be actual physically tampering with it where they get into like, you know, acid attacks where they're melting away layers of circuitry and using all kinds of fancy equipment in a lab. And uh, those are far from easy. And those require very specialized equipment and plenty of alone time with the smart card. But the most practical attacks, in so much as we know today, are differential power analysis, the side channel attack that is that. Let's move on to question number two and leave smart cards behind. ISO 27018 provides guidance and recommendations to cloud service providers 
on storing personally identifiable information, PII, in their clouds. My question for you is, of the list that I'm going to show you, which of them is not one of the principles that should be followed by cloud service providers? There's your answer choices. Look them over. Think about it. When you're ready, click play. We can walk through. Personally identifiable information is obviously a big hot button topic in the world these days of making sure as an organization that you are providing adequate protections, either purely from an ethical perspective, but more than likely from a legal perspective uh, for your customer's information. Because of the integration of cloud services and organizations storing their information in the cloud, you have one conversation that takes place to go in and say, okay, I'm an organization storing my data in the cloud. I have to make sure that I'm protecting my customer's information for my PII protection requirements. But the cloud service provider, the organization who you're using to actually store your data, Amazon or Microsoft or Dropbox or some, somebody like that, they have concerns about the storage of your PII in their cloud. So they want to make sure that they're doing everything that is appropriate that's going to provide adequate controls and adequate responses if there's a breach on their end. And that's what um, ISO 27, uh, 2718 goes in and addresses, is how should cloud service providers go in and participate in this overall you know, larger topic of protecting PII when it's stored in the cloud. The first is, is that the cloud service providers must have the consent of the customer before doing anything that is you know, particularly marketing related or business related with somebody's PII. Okay, so you can't, you as a cloud service provider can't do anything with it unless you get consent from the customer. That assumes that you even have access to it at all, but anything that is determined to be PII, they must have consent to go in and do something with. The second option on the list is also one of the principles is that uh, the customer maintains control over how anything that is PII related for them is used. So the cloud service provider has no say-so that's going to override what the customer says regarding use of PII. The third option says that the cloud service provider is going to have to maintain encrypted backups of the customer's data. And no, that is not something that is detailed in ISO 27018 uh, and is not considered to be, I don't want to say a requirement, but a recommendation uh, as far as that ISO uh, standard. So. Uh, that's not the right answer, which, which I'm sorry, that is the right answer because we're looking for what's not going to be as included as one of the objectives for ISO 27018. So there's your right answer. Let's look through the rest of them. Uh, the next option is transparency. Yes, transparency about where the customer's data is actually stored and anything surrounding the use of subcontractors that might be dealing with the customer's PII, all of that stuff needs to be disclosed. The cloud service provider needs to be transparent. Next option is also one of the uh, objectives is that if there is a breach, there should be clear, concise, and expedient communication regarding the breach with the customer. And the last option is also included in 27018, which says that the cloud service provider should make themselves available for an annual external audit. Um, that should also be something that's included in there. So the one that we were not going to include on this list um, as far as the, the very broad topic of uh, uh, ISO 27018 is that the cloud service providers, not, it's not recommended that they maintain encrypted backups of all of the customer's data. All right, two more questions down. See you next time.